Thanks to iStock Photo for contributing footage to this episode. Check them out at iStockPhoto.com. The genes in our bodies can be traced back over three and a half billion years to a single organism, LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. As LUCA reproduced, its genes copied and copied and copied and copied. Sometimes, with mistakes, they transformed. Over time, this produced every one of the billions of species of life on Earth. Some of these adopted sexual reproduction, combining the genes of individuals, and altogether, the best adapted life forms prospered. This is evolution. Copy, transform, and combine. And culture evolves in a similar way, but the elements aren't genes, they're memes. Ideas, behaviors, skills. Memes are copied, transformed, and combined. And the dominant ideas of our time are the memes that spread the most. This is social evolution. Copy, transform, and combine. It's who we are, it's how we live, and of course, it's how we create. Our new ideas evolve from the old ones. But our system of law doesn't acknowledge the derivative nature of creativity. Instead, ideas are regarded as property, as unique and original lots with distinct boundaries. But ideas aren't so tidy. They're layered, they're interwoven, they're tangled. And when the system conflicts with the reality, the system starts to fail. For almost our entire history, ideas were free. The works of Shakespeare, Gutenberg, and Rembrandt could be openly copied and built upon. But the growing dominance of the market economy, where the products of our intellectual labors are bought and sold, produced an unfortunate side effect. Let's say a guy invents a better light bulb. His price needs to cover not just the manufacturing cost, but also the cost of inventing the thing in the first place. Now let's say a competitor starts manufacturing a competing copy. The competitor doesn't need to cover those development costs, so his version can be cheaper. The bottom line? Original creations can't compete with the price of copies. In the United States, the introduction of copyrights and patents was intended to address this imbalance. Copyrights covered media, patents covered inventions. Both aim to encourage the creation and proliferation of new ideas by providing a brief and limited period of exclusivity, a period where no one else could copy your work. This gave creators a window in which to cover their investments and earn a profit. After that, their work entered the public domain, where it could spread far and wide and be freely built upon. And it was this that was the goal, a robust public domain, an affordable body of ideas, products, arts and entertainment available to all. The core belief was in the common good, what would benefit everyone. But over time, the influence of the market transformed this principle beyond recognition. Influential thinkers proposed that ideas are a form of property, and this conviction would eventually yield a new term, intellectual property. This was a meme that would multiply wildly, thanks in part to a quirk of human psychology known as loss aversion. Simply, people tend to place a much higher value on losses than on gains. So the gains we get from copying the work of others don't make a big impression. But when it's our ideas being copied, we perceive this as a loss and we get territorial. For instance, Disney made extensive use of the public domain. Stories like Snow White, Pinocchio, and Alice in Wonderland were all taken from the public domain. But when it came time for the copyright of Disney's early films to expire, they lobbied to have the term of copyright extended. Artist Shepard Ferry has frequently used existing art in his work. This practice came to a head when he was sued by the Associated Press for basing his famous Obama Hope poster on their photo. Nonetheless, when it was his imagery used in a piece by Baxter Orr, Ferry threatened to sue. And lastly, Steve Jobs was sometimes boastful about Apple's history of copying. We have, you know, always uh, been shameless about stealing great ideas. But he harbored deep grudges against those who dared to copy Apple. I'm going to destroy Android because it's a stolen product. I'm willing to go thermonuclear war on this. When we copy, we justify it. When others copy, we vilify it. Most of us have no problem with copying as long as we're the ones doing it.
So with a blind eye toward our own mimicry and propelled by faith in markets and ownership, intellectual property swelled beyond its original scope with broader interpretations of existing laws, new legislation, new realms of coverage, and alluring rewards. In 1981, George Harrison lost a $1.5 million case for subconsciously copying the doo-wop hit He's So Fine in his ballad, My Sweet Lord. Prior to this, plenty of songs sounded much more like other songs without ending up in court. Ray Charles created the prototype for soul music when he based I Got a Woman on the gospel song It Must Be Jesus. Starting in the late 90s, a series of new copyright laws and regulations began to be introduced, and many more are in the works. The most ambitious in scope are trade agreements. Because these are treaties and not laws, they can be negotiated in secret, with no public input and no congressional approval. In 2011, ACTA was signed by President Obama, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, currently being written in secret, aims to spread even stronger U.S.-style protections around the world. Of course, when the United States itself was a developing economy, it refused to sign treaties and had no protection for foreign creators. Charles Dickens famously complained about America's bustling book piracy market, calling it a horrible thing that scoundrel booksellers should grow rich. Patent coverage made the leap from physical inventions to virtual ones, most notably software. But this is not a natural transition. A patent is a blueprint for how to make an invention. Software patents are more like a loose description of what something would be like if it actually was invented. And software patents are written in the broadest possible language to get the broadest possible protection. The vagueness of these terms can sometimes reach absurd levels. For example, information manufacturing machine, which covers anything computer-like, or material object, which covers pretty much anything. The fuzziness of software patents boundaries has turned the smartphone industry into one giant turf war. 62% of all patent lawsuits are now over software. The estimated wealth lost is half a trillion dollars. The expanding reach of intellectual property has introduced more and more possibilities for opportunistic litigation, suing to make a buck. Two new species evolved whose entire business model is lawsuits, sample trolls and patent trolls. These are corporations that don't actually produce anything. They acquire a library of intellectual property rights, then litigate to earn profits. And because legal defense is hundreds of thousands of dollars in copyright cases and millions in patents, their targets are usually highly motivated to settle out of court. The most famous sample troll is Bridgeport Music, which has filed hundreds of lawsuits. In 2005, they scored an influential court decision over this two-second sample. That's it. And not only was the sample short, it was virtually unrecognizable. This verdict essentially rendered any kind of sampling, no matter how small, infringing. The sample-heavy musical collages of hip-hop's golden age are now impossibly expensive to create. Now, patent trolls are most common back in that troubled realm of software. And perhaps the most inexplicable case is that of Paul Allen. He's one of the founders of Microsoft, he's a billionaire, he's an esteemed philanthropist who's pledged to give away much of his fortune, and he claims basic web features like related links, alerts, and recommendations were invented by his long-defunct company. So the self-proclaimed idea man sued pretty much all of Silicon Valley in 2010, and he did this despite no lack of fame or fortune. So to recap, the full picture looks like this. We believe that ideas are property and we're excessively territorial when we feel that property belongs to us. Our laws then indulge this bias with ever-broadening protections and massive rewards. 
Meanwhile, huge legal fees encourage defendants to pay up and settle out of court. It's a discouraging scenario, and it begs the question, what now? The belief in intellectual property has grown so dominant, it's pushed the original intent of copyrights and patents out of the public consciousness. But that original purpose is still right there in plain sight. The Copyright Act of 1790 is entitled, An Act for the Encouragement of Learning. The Patent Act is to promote the progress of useful arts. The exclusive rights these acts introduced were a compromise for a greater purpose. The intent was to better the lives of everyone by incentivizing creativity and producing a rich public domain, a shared pool of knowledge open to all. But exclusive rights themselves came to be considered the point, so they were strengthened and expanded, and the result hasn't been more progress or more learning, it's been more squabbling and more abuse. We live in an age with daunting problems. We need the best ideas possible, we need them now, we need them to spread fast. The common good is a meme that was overwhelmed by intellectual property. It needs to spread again. If the meme prospers, our laws, our norms, our society, they all transform. That's social evolution, and it's not up to governments, corporations, or lawyers. It's up to us. Hi there, I'm Kirby. I made Everything is a Remix with help from these folks. Two people in particular contributed a lot of time. I'd like to thank them real quick by name. Louis Wesolowski did about 15 pieces of motion graphics work for me. Uh, he contributed a lot of time, a lot of effort, and the video is better because of it. Uh, my thanks to Louis. Thanks also to Juan Behrens, who did the uh, memes animation, which took a lot of work. My thanks to Juan for his patience on that. Uh, I'd like to thank also iStock Photo for uh, their support. They donated a lot of stock footage to this episode, and I think it was one of the elements that helped raise uh, the production quality of this episode to the highest level that it's been yet. So if you are in need of royalty-free stock footage, do check them out because they have a good service and they are nice people. But most of all, I want to thank you for your attention. I really do value it, and I try very, very hard to make the most of that time that you give me. So thank you so much for coming along on this journey with me. It was an absolute joy to do it. I get asked all the time if there's more after this. If there's not, this is the conclusion. This is the end. There are extra things that you might enjoy, but that's the end of the main story. So uh, there'll probably be another supplement video, kind of like the Matrix and Tarantino ones that Rob G. Wilson made for me. There'll probably be another video along that line. Uh, I also have a talk coming up that will sort of uh, use the same material, but sort of reframe it, uh, streamline and kind of upgrade the argument. And I think it, it should be really good. I'll also have limited edition t-shirts and posters for sale in the near future. So if you would like a memento, uh, stay tuned for those. I think they'll be very nice. And lastly, I have a new project coming up that I am seriously excited about it. And if you are patient, hint, hint, you can probably find out more about that. 
my thanks, my sincere, heartfelt thanks for watching. Uh, it was really a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Um, take care, and I'll see you next time with a whole new thing. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.